Good evening. My name is Phil Schomber. I'm the adult programmer here at Hedberg. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker, Chris Sturdevant. Chris is a Janesville native and author of Cold War Wisconsin, and he's here to share some of the interesting, though perhaps lesser known stories uh, of Wisconsin's role in the events of the Cold War between the United States and Soviet Union. Would you please welcome Chris Sturdevant. All right, am I on the microphone? I assume I'm on the microphone. Hopefully I don't move around too much. Uh, um, this is great, nice to be back. Philip and I have known each other for several years now. We met at a leadership conference in my day job, which is as a children's librarian at the Waukesha Public Library. The Cold War um, passion has been forever, growing up in the 70s and 80s and, and watching so much on the TV screen, watching uh, you know, the Chernobyl incident happen, the Berlin Wall fall down, these summits you know, that uh, Reagan and Gorbachev would have. That was such a drama. You know, the nightly news, you know, Reagan would walk out on Gorbachev, <gasps> you know, so there's a, a lot of Cold War history. Uh, one of my first memories, and I talk about these in my, in my book, is, uh, you know, the Solidarity Movement in Poland it was such a memorable thing. I'm coming of age, probably nine years old, reading the Janesville Gazette, and they're talking about these crackdowns in Warsaw and um, martial law, and uh, what is this all about? Uh, I was always curious about the Soviet Union. Why do they stand in line to get bread? You know, why, why is everything so dull in the Soviet Union, everything so bright? You can just notice this um, just as a child and you see, uh, as you'd come to see these, uh, you know, photos and videos of like West Berlin, East Berlin. West Berlin's all lit up. You get all the lights going on and nightlife and you go to East Berlin and everything is drab, green, brown, black. And of course, those colors are military colors. They really didn't... Um, want to produce many things that were of color um, for you know, whatever reason, probably production costs, but it was all military-based uh, with the Soviet Union. So this book here, um, you know, again, lifelong passion. Uh, so this is where the roots of uh, a lot of my forward are, is growing up in Janesville. And the kind of the perception growing up is, wow, that Cold War is so far away. I don't, I don't see the Berlin Wall in my backyard. I don't see things physically or people involved in the war against the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. That was a big thing, obviously, in the 80s. Um, we're far away from, are we a nuclear target? You know, it, it, didn't, it didn't phase me at all. Like, nothing happens here. I'm watching all this from afar. And so in later years, as I'll get to in my presentation, is actually visiting some of these Cold War countries with Cold War legacy countries. Uh, so it's quite a journey. It's a journey of the Cold War that a lot of you in this room uh, lived through, remember. But it's also something that's very hard to teach a different generation um, that's probably a little bit less younger than I am. Because uh, when I would first start these Cold War talks I would do about 20 years ago, I would start talking about the Cold War. And I'd start talking about the Cold War Museum, which I am a ch uh, Midwest chapter chairman. I hooked up with uh, Francis Gary Powers Jr. in Washington, D.C. many years ago. Uh, he had his own museum at the national level. You can go to the National Cold War Museum. And myself was trying to get on board with creating a Cold War Museum in Waukesha, which is on a former nuclear missile base, which I'll get to in a moment. And so the restoration of this base and inviting Gary Powers uh, was a nice, formidable alliance. And um, he would be he would allow me to get introduced to some of these other sons and daughters of the Cold War. Uh, Sergei Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev's son, invited him uh, many years ago, and he just passed away uh, two years ago now. Um, Jamie Eisen Eisenhower, Eisenhower's grandchildren, um, Julie Nixon. So a lot of these people I would start getting connected with, spies, Cold War spies. Uh, John Van Altna, um, who taught in the Janesville School District for many years, lives in Milton. Um, is part of my book. He was actually a Stasi prisoner for many years. So there's a lot of these local connections that built upon this childhood growing up and then going off to college and then um, trying to reassemble what happened to the Cold War uh, in general and what was so local about the Cold War. And I think you'll be fascinated with that. So when I started talking about the Cold War, then I was talking about, talking about the Cold War Museum. And people would come up to me afterward and go, where is the old war museum? Where's the cold water museum? What are you talking about? I would bring up the words uh, U2 to school kids and even generally to groups. 
uh, meaning the U2 spy plane. And people would say, I thought you were talking about the rock band. I thought you were talking about Bono. Uh, Nike systems, Nike missile systems that I'll talk about. Uh, surface to air missile bases that we had here in the, in the, well, in the Milwaukee area. Well, Nike, that's a shoe. So the, the terminology of talking about the Cold War uh, meant different things to newer generations that were very far away from, uh, again, that generation where we had the duck and cover drills, that we had the constant bombardment of the threat of nuclear war. We'd have the two minutes to midnight type, uh, the, the doomsday clocks, you know, that kind of thing that was very prevalent in the 1980s, but then disappeared after about 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell down, and 1991, of course, when the Soviet Union failed to exist. Uh, the Gulf War happens, September 11th happens, history just kind of marches on. But this is my uh, first book. The Wisconsin book is my first book. Uh, I have since published the Cold War Illinois book, which features, again, the local connections of Illinois, uh, home state of Ronald Reagan, very instrumental, obviously, in the Cold War. Walt Disney, of all people, born in Chicago, uh, had a connection to the Cold War early on, because early on the Cold War, we're talking uh, right after World War I, when there were a lot of anarchists, socialists, communists in this country that were wreaking havoc. And so you had bombings going off in Chicago. And Walt Disney was a postal worker in a federal building uh, during the time that it was bombed in 1921. And that, uh, some of the, uh, you see some of these like um, Vietnam War, who was the trial with the, the Chicago 7? Uh, it's the 1960s uh, movie now. But before that, you know, there were protesters way back in the 1920s that were put on trial. So a lot of the roots of like um, radicals, Chicago radicals, that sort of thing. Uh, spies, Robert Hansen uh, was, was apprehended in 2001, probably our worst double agent in history. Got a lot of our agents killed all over the world, including inside the Soviet Union. Bobby Fischer, chess champion uh, from Chicago, Illinois. And the birthplace of the atomic bomb, if you can imagine, on the University of Chicago campus. So Illinois is, of course, a different uh, perspective, but a similar concept of the Cold War that has largely been ignored. My friend Werner Juretzko, who I dedicate a lot of my talks to, longtime uh, friend of mine, mentor. He was with the Cold War Museum, the, uh, the uh, foreign affairs type things. He traveled quite a bit around the world, got a lot of connections abroad. Uh, Werner was a G2 spy agent. Uh, he always said that he never spied, he collected intelligence. The other side spies, right? They're the bad guys. We just collect and gather intelligence. Uh, but Werner and I were very close. Uh, this is the, um, in Felix Drzezinski's office in the International Spy Museum. If you watch, visit Washington, D.C., find the original Cheka, the original secret police in the Soviet Union, uh, way back in, uh, the, again, the post-World War I era, when the uh, Lenin and Stalin and all sorts of characters, even Jagger Hoover, Winston Churchill, were among those involved in that kind of era of diplomacy. We do have a documentary that we have done in Werner's um, honor. If you're ever interested in that, um, you can go to, uh, I can give you more information. I've got some flyers and whatnot. We show the documentary about what it is like to be a spy. He was apprehended in 1953, served six years in Stasi prisons, and uh, came to Chicago in the early 1960s and lived kind of a normal life until I kind of inadvertently coaxed, coaxed him out of retirement. And we did quite a few programs over the years. But as I talk about the Cold War, as I alluded to, does anybody remember the Cold War? And I say these things, and people, where's the Cold Water Museum? What's the, what's the Old War? You know, um, I think about a lot of the nostalgia or some of the current times, or the current at the contemporary in that era, even like in the 1950s or 60s. How do we remember the Cold War? Um, the reenactors hiding under the desk. You know, um, reenactors in every other era. If you do, if you go to a Civil War battlefield, and there's Civil War reenactors, revolutionary reenactors, World War II. Uh, this is apparently what the Cold War reenactors do. We just sit under the desk and duck and cover. Uh, if you remember uh, Bert the Turtle, who was, um, you know, singing and dancing on that black and white uh, Civil Defense film. You can see kind of those old ones are fun to watch. Um, and you see a little boy that's, you know, got the bike, and you know, if you see a flash, you know, hide behind a, you know, this is going to save you, or the picnic, you know, people are out on the picnic on the, on the film there, and oh, you got to put this blanket over you, and that's going to save you from that, from that blast, you know, do what you can. Um, so, Charlie Brown, you know, H-bomb test, <laughs> imagine that, your kids, and you're playing, practicing H-bomb in the backyard, and who could forget Boris and Natasha, you know, always going after moose and squirrel, 
and they're always chasing him. And so these were these Soviet agents that were within our sphere. They're, they're the people next door. You don't know where they are. Um, the Eisenhower Museum runs cartoons like that in Kansas and the Presidential Library. So they, take, they make good use of 1950s America. And this is my childhood, of course, watching these movies that uh, scared the living you-know-what out of us. Um, these movies like Damnation Alley, The Day After, What's Going to Happen After the Atomic Bomb, Mad Max. You know, that was Armageddon, right? But more colorfully speaking, the, the James Bond. You know, that's, so when I talk about the Cold War and I'd start bringing up these types of connections and people, oh yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah, Cold War. Uh, James Bond, who was always on the case uh, against Spectre. Uh, it was always like, it wasn't quite the Soviet US thing. He was the British and he was, it was always that third party, right? That third, that third party, the third vi party villain that was going to uh, obs make the world obsolete, right? Uh, Rocky, Rocky IV. That was the gasp moment when Rocky was going to fight Ivan Drago in Russia. <gasps> he's going to go to Russia. And he trained in all the snow and the tundra, and he's dragging the logs, and he's the very primitive methods, and he's going to go on a very high-tech, the Soviets. You know, Ivan Drago's on that treadmill, and he's got the oxygen mask, and he's got the electronic, and boy, uh, I, Rocky was doomed, right? And then he just pulled it out for America. That series, of course, has continued on with Apollo Creed's um, son. And so those are actually really great movies. And the latest one has him fighting Ivan Drago's son. So it becomes this very personal conflict between Rocky and Ivan Drago and then the kids. The joke for many years was uh, David Hasselhoff. Um, David Hasselhoff saved the world and ended the Cold War. And you know where that joke came from is after the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, David Hasselhoff was in, in there singing, right? He got up there and just, he was singing these concerts and all the Berliners were, ah, oh, David Hasselhoff, you know. Um, so he became this, almost this symbol of how he uh, ended the Cold War. And celebrity status befell the guys on the right there. That's Charlie Sheen and Patrick Swayze, Red Dawn, one of my favorite movies as a kid growing up. That was the invasion of the mostly Cuban but Soviet advisors of the United States, and it took place in a Colorado town. And the kids in this high school, you know, Wolverines, you know, they're the ones fighting back, and they're jumping out of the grass, and they're blowing, you know, taking fire against the Soviet and the Cuban troops, and they're making it miserable, making it their Vietnam. And so the Cuban, you know, commander at the end realizes it's just a fait accompli, I can't win here, and they leave, all because these teenagers, you know, save the day um, in that town in Colorado. So again, popular culture, Cold War, great connections. The veterans of the Cold War, you know, 22 million veterans served during that whole era. It was the most populous, as of the 2010 census, the most veterans of a conflict. But it's never been defined. Cold War is never defined. There's been never any victory medals. There were never any parades. Soviet Union lost, and we just like, eh, just went about life, right? Nothing ever happened. Uh, but clearly, there were a lot of veterans that deserved a lot of heroism. We had uh, several thousand deaths, training accidents, uh, deaths we can't even talk about. If they're still classified. Some of these secret missions behind the Iron Curtain uh, with helicopters, reconnaissance aircraft, people lost at sea, submarine, submarines that went down. We have so many deaths that happened during the Cold War. It was not a bloodless conflict for 50 years. But most veteran eras we know about, we hear about them. We heard about them in different eras. We know that um, Jim Garner and Ed McMahon were Korean War veterans. Pat Sajak was a Vietnam veteran. Rocky Blyer's story, you know, the Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh Steelers running back. Uh, so, uh, so we get uh, Ted Williams would be like a World War II Korea pilot. So we knew about the celebrities that served during these, these, this era. But we don't know much about the Cold War veterans, other than maybe that guy in the middle. Who's that guy in the middle? Elvis Presley is probably the most famous Cold War veteran. He went into the army. He went kind of back and forth with the colonel. Do I enlist? Do I get out? Or do I not uh, serve my country? And the colonel, yeah, you should just go do do your two-year term. And he did that. And he had shaved. And he got the uniform on. And he probably gained a lot of respect for that and a lot more fans. Uh, he was serving in, in West Germany. That's where the army sent him. And wouldn't you believe the East Germans didn't like it? Ooh, hoo, hoo, right? The East Germans were convinced that the United States sent Elvis there to corrupt their teenagers. 
Because after all, as we learned on Forrest Gump, right, he's got that shaking the hips and stuff, and oh, how dare you, you know, the East German censors were like, oh, you can't have that here. You and your, uh, those girls with those poodle skirts and the bobby socks, you know, get that, ah, ah, get that, ah, get that rebellion out of here. And it scared the East Germans so much that they actually conducted a waltz. They said, here, teenagers, you have to dance like this. Don't be dancing like this guy, you know, with the microphone. Uh, that's taboo. You know, we got to have a very structured utopian society here. So they went so far as to do an actual dance and instructed them how to dance, as could communist regimes do. I did meet a guy back in, uh, I was doing a talk in Iowa a couple years ago. He served during the same time as Elvis nearby, in a nearby base in West Germany. He said that an incentive one weekend was they do their training exercises for a couple of days, survival training keep you on your toes, that type thing, out in the wilderness there in West Germany. He said, three days off, three days liberty, three days vacation to anyone who finds Elvis. Because Elvis is out there. And if you capture Elvis in these training drills, you get three days off. Well, nobody found Elvis. And he, was, he laughed because he's like, you know what, we pretty much figured out Elvis probably wasn't there. And they were just motivating us to go out there and try to find Elvis and keep our morale up. Nonetheless, Elvis, uh, you know, history went on for Elvis. He got out of the army after a two-year stint. The guy on the left, does anybody who know who that is? Very famous. Bob Ross. The one on the left. Uh, do you want to go up top here? Leonard Nimoy. Leonard Nimoy. You got Leonard Nimoy. You got two of them. Congratulations. You got two of them. Uh, so down here with the mobs, that's Leonard Nimoy, live long and prosper. Uh, Leonard Nimoy was a, uh, in the army, enlisted in the army. And uh, top left, I already gave it away, because that's the most, uh, who, can, who can forget Bob Ross, you know. Bob Ross um, got a lot of inspiration for his paintings from being in the Air Force. He was a 20-year guy. He was enlisted. He was born in Florida. He's from Florida. He went in the Air Force. Naturally, they stationed him in Alaska, farthest you can get away from warm weather. Well, Bob Ross had developed a knack for painting, because he, he had a lot of time on his hands. So he's up there, wow, this is really beautiful, beautiful scenery here. I'm going to paint these trees here, and I'm going to do this quickly because i got to get back. And so he came up with that wet-on-wet -wet technique. You always hear about the wet-on-wet, -wet. <laughs> quick, because he had to grab that sandwich. He had a 30-minute break, you know, at lunch. He's quick doing these paintings. He became a drill sergeant at some point. He's yelling all the time. Well, i got to do something about it. How about we have a happy place here? That looks like a happy bush there. That's a happy trees. It's all happy. And so a very congenial guy whenever you watched Bob Ross. But a lot of that was the effect of being in the Air Force, a very regimented uh, discipline, and then being angry all the time and just being stressed out. So this was his outlet. And of course, he's very famous today. The Bob Ross brands just really took off. The Halloween costumes, you name it. Um, Bob Ross lives on. What about the top right-hand corner there? Is that Hendrick? Not Morgan, Jimi Hendrix. Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman, very good. Morgan Freeman went in the Air Force. He went in the Air Force to fly in the, in the jet age, right? It's the 1950s. It goes in about 1955, 1956, somewhere around there. And he hops in the cockpit. Well, probably not going to be for me. He just realizes the romantic aspects of war, the dangers that go into it. Uh, decides that it's not quite for him, so he's going to become a uh, technician, like a radar technician. So that was what he did in the Air Force. But again, Cold War veteran uh, from Morgan Freeman. Bottom and right side, I think it might be a little bit obvious. I don't know if the writing is going to show up on there. Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash. Well, you get a star. I've got to give you like a star or something today. You get a star on the Janesville Hedberg Library Hall of Fame. Johnny Cash uh, on the Air uh, when the Air Force in the early 1950s, he's assigned as an eavesdropper. He's listening for traffic in West Berlin. In 1953, when he's there, he's on, he's, on the, he's on duty, and he's listening. He's listening into that traffic from the East German talk, the Soviets talking. There is kind of a middleman translating, because I don't think he actually knew uh, Russian or German, but knew uh, enough to hear things and kind of pick them out. He is purportedly the first American to learn in March of 1953, that Joseph Stalin has died. So he's picking that up on the, uh, on the traffic that they're listening in on. 
So significant Cold War service for all these gentlemen, uh, especially like Johnny Cash learning Stalin is that. It's a very secretive country. They didn't let that information out clearly. Uh, a little bit about the Cold War Museum as we go along here. Uh, do a lot of talks, a lot of educational talks, a lot of programming. This is Francis Gary Powers Jr. and I on the set of TMJ4. We were, he was in town promoting the Bridge of Spies. How many of you have seen the Bridge of Spies movie? So it's a great movie, Steven Spielberg, Tom Hanks. It's something you should watch. It's entertaining and very harrowing. It tells the story of Gary's father, Francis Gary Powers. He was the U-2 pilot on a mission across the Soviet Union to photograph uh, missile installations and other uh, things, points of interest in his trip from uh, Turkey all the way to uh, um, Sweden. He gets shot down on May Day, May 1st, 1960. Uh, Nikita Khrushchev, of course, keeps it quiet. The United States knows something has happened, but they're not quite sure what to do because nobody knew about the U-2 spy plane program. Nobody knew about the CIA in 1960. Nobody knew about the NSA, National Security Agency. Nobody knew except a very few select people. And so they have to kind of, Eisenhower has to kind of cover. Um, it was a weather problem. Um, there was visibility problems. We lost our plane that was over there to survey. Again, weather issues. That's what they always said. Why we had weather interests in central Mo in, you know, Russia, you know, that's one you can probably ask yourself. And after a couple of days, all of a sudden, Khrushchev comes out and says, now we've got your pilot. So his father is a prisoner in uh, Lubyanka prison for close to 18 months. During the time before that, though, we caught Colonel Rudolf Abel, who is the uh, highest ranking Soviet spy that we had ever captured. And the reason why that guy was known to us, or what really tipped off his trail, is that nickel there. It's the story of the hollow nickel. Because a nickel was given to a newsboy in New York City for a tip. Here's some tip. You know, say, Thanks, kid. It was a housekeeper at an apartment. And the kid's back home counting his change, and this one doesn't feel right. Well, it doesn't feel right because there's some micro, micro, uh, microchip in there. This is obviously something wrong with this, tells his parents. Parents call the police. Police call the FBI. They're on the trail. It took them a few years, but they caught Colonel Rudolph Abel. And so the Bridge of Spies story tells the story of the James Donovan, who is Tom Hanks' character, mediating an expiant exchange for Francis Gary Powers and Rudolph Abel across the Glenica Bridge in, um, uh, right outside of Berlin. So that's the movie version of it. Again, great movie, great story. Uh, and it tells you a little bit about our foreign policy, of course, at the time during the spy swaps during the Cold War. We have an actual Stasi cell door at the safe house in Milwaukee. This is one of two or three, I think two. One is at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. One is in Milwaukee. So if you ever come visit us in Milwaukee, come to the safe house. If you've never been there, it's a, it's a real treat. That is a couple of uh, my acquaintances, both Werner Juretzko that I mentioned and John Van Altna. He was also a Stasi prisoner. Um, the cell door that you see in the movie Bridge of Spies, if, when you go see it, uh, Tom Hanks' character is behind the Iron Curtain on his own and he gets thrown in jail for a night. That is shown, that movie, that scene is shown in Hohen Schoenhausen Prison, which is a museum now. And that cell door was the one next to the one Tom Hanks' character slept in. So it's got a lot of historical significance there. Other ways, again, we can talk about the Cold War. I talked about how difficult it is to talk about the Cold War. Um, civil defense. We have, the, as a Cold War museum, the largest civil defense collection in the country, probably in the world, probably maybe outside of Russia, because the, uh, the FEMA, the predecessor to FEMA, when they changed hands in the 90s, when they renamed and reorganized, they didn't know what to do with all of their Geiger counters, toilet paper, um, medicine, penicillin, you name it. Uh, so they bequeathed it to the Cold War Museum in Washington, D.C. This happens to be just a few things that I have in, in my basement. So if you ever need a place to stay during Armageddon, I've got the Geiger counters, I've got gauze, I've got everything. Uh, we, can, we can survive for two weeks. We can play cards and use the commode there. Um, but again, so, so civil defense was a big thing for kids during the era. The most surprising thing when I do a lot of these events, most numerous that I come up with, there's, there's oftentimes one person 
who comes up to me after the show and says, you know what? I was assigned as a kid to go stand on the roof of my school at a certain time to look around for Soviet aircraft. And this could have been anywhere, usually in northern Wisconsin, around the, usually the northern latitudes, Indiana. And I'd say, what is, you know, originally I said, what is that all about? She said, well, auxiliary groups, Cub Scouts, kids, whatever, needed something to do with service hours for their uh, volunteer. We, the threat was so real that we thought we were going to be invaded. And so they were sent up with sometimes, uh, you know, these little slips of paper that had silhouettes of what Soviet aircraft looked like. Uh, so it's a really odd thing. None of you did that, right? <laughs> but I do get that quite a bit uh, to be noticeable enough. So that was something that those, those kids would do. Um, you know, and usually it was kind of like, why are you sending me up here? I'm bored. You know, I'd sit up there for an hour going like this to the, you know, in the skies and whatnot. But civil defense clearly was big in, our, in all of our communities. We still have, we used to have fall shelter sign here many years ago. I'm sure that's gone. Um, but they're, they're still around uh, here and there. Usually churches, you'll see those fall shelter signs. But the best uh, resource we have in the Milwaukee area is an actual radar site from the Nike era. The Nike missile systems were uh, surface-to-air missiles that were built and designed to intercept long-range Soviet bombers. So if you think about what we used during the Second World War for anti-aircraft, you, know, you know, that kind of thing. This was the upgrade in the missile era, right? We had missile technology thanks to that guy, Werner von Braun, that we brought here, right? So we designed these, and right after World War II, started developing them, refining them, to the point where we had uh, conventional warheads on over 200 missile sites around the United States, mostly around very large cities, metropolitan areas, as you can see on the map. Um, Milwaukee, Gary, Chicago was the sector that uh, this area would have belonged in. So should, again, long-range bombers with these nuclear payloads that were going to be targeting a lot of our factories, foundries, Alice Chalmers, International Harvester, Oshkosh Truck was around. We had paper mills. So not only the populations were the target during the Cold War, uh, but a lot of the capacity to create war was in this area. So that's why we were a target. Uh, generally, I think the Akudine Corporation was, uh, you know, housed nuclear, uh, nuclear material. There were some things that I, that I learned there in the book, uh, even in this area here, nuclear plants uh, in the area. So that's why we were a target. So that missile site is a great place because behind on the site is about a 13-acre property that the city's developing finally. Um, we've done a lot of educational programs with the Nike veterans that would come say, here, this is why this was here. Um, there were eight in the Milwaukee area at one time. They shrunk down to three when we realized really quick that the, the Ajax, which was the first generation conventional, was kind of like a bottle rocket. You know, it went up a couple hundred feet, and that was just one at a time, right? And so someone had the genius idea, why don't we put nuclear weapons on them? Because that way, if this is the last line of defense, kiss your butt goodbye, at least we can take somebody, some of these planes out, uh, and then the nuclear explosion clearly would wipe out a squadron and not just one solitary aircraft. Now what's going to happen to that after we, if, if that would have happened, right? We're back to square one, we're doomed. But if they had gotten this far, honestly, we were doomed. This was it. Uh, because we had, uh, in that era, it would have been the near Canada line, the distant early warning line. So the fight that we wanted to have was actually north uh, into Canada because there was less population. So we had all these different layers of defense, fighters, bombers around the clock in Canada, and then near the near Canada line, which would have been the border. And then if they got this far, this was it, right? Uh, but at the Nike site in Waukesha, that was one of the nuclear sites. There was one north in the city in River Hills. And believe it or not, if any of you have been to the Summerfest grounds, that was a nuclear missile base right there. So that was, when you go to Summerfest with a couple hundred thousand people in normal times, uh, probably very few people would realize that that's what was there. But it's a great place to, again, tell Cold War history. This is phys something physical you can look at, and this is why it was here. But in my capacity as a librarian, I talk, again, education, education. Um, let's talk about my book. I invite people here that had some sort of significance in the Cold War. Sergei Khrushchev, that was in the photo in the, on the missile base along with Gary Powers. Um, again, you can tell the story of what it's like to grow up in the Soviet Union, as was Eugene Yelchin. He's not a household name. He did write a Newbery Honor Award, Breaking Stalin's Nose, and some other books like Arcady's Goal, which is uh, boys growing up in the Soviet Union, Soviet times. 
Eugene Yelchin might not have a household name, but those of you who have seen the Coca-Cola polar bear ad, uh, he was part of the team that created that in the early 1990s, late 1980s. He was a graphic designer by trade, an artist, and he came here from the Soviet Union in 1983 and came to Hollywood, came to LA to get a job, get a kind of new lease on life, immigrated here, he's age 27. Well, as most 20-somethings did at that age in Hollywood, he started going to punk rock clubs. He befriended who would, a man who would become the producer of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. And so he ended up uh, with this, this illustrious kind of random, he, was on a, he actually won an Academy Award for the movie Rango with Johnny, that was voiced on part of Johnny Depp. So just an incredible, incredible guy and just the most down-to-earth guy that would tell you what it's like uh, growing up in the Soviet Union, uh, showing me pictures of, uh, you know, the photo albums of people that were no longer, uh, they were enemies of the state. You can't associate with this uncle of yours. It'd be blacked out. Uh, this person here was, was uh, sent to a Siberian prison. We're going to rip that guy's picture out. Uh, really made it to the point, you know, smuggling books that were like this big. His dad was an avid reader, you know, smuggling those little books to try to read something because everything was censored so heavily in the Soviet Union. And it was very hard for him to actually write. He said a lot of Soviet citizens, when they come to the United States, are very quiet. That's why you don't hear a lot, because they don't know who to trust. They still have that wired in their brain. He told me of a woman that he knows that wrote a very scathing piece about Vladimir Lenin and this is, in, uh, this is probably within the last decade, in a major magazine. She went home to Russia to meet with her mom, who was probably in her 70s at that time, knocked on the door. Her mom opened the door, handed her a note, slammed it in her face. The note said, don't come back here. I don't know you. I don't want to be associated with you. But you can see the trauma, again, with a lot of these folks who grew up in the Soviet Union. He was told that he couldn't play outside because the, the Americans dropped an atomic bomb and there's fallout in the rain, lack of information. You know, so many horror stories. But what he's talking about in this book that I did as a book club at the Waksha Library is a little boy growing up in the 1930s. His dad is part of the secret police. The boy is a good young communist. He's going to hold the flag in the parade in a couple days. So he's going to hold this flag, the flag of the you know, Soviet Union. He's going to lead the parade. He's this young communist. His dad's a great communist until the knock on the door in the middle of the night, dragged away. No questions. No questions asked. No answers. So the young boy is delus disillusioned. He's like, well, I better write Comrade Stalin. He actually writes a you know, fictitious, dear Comrade Stalin, you've made a mistake. My dad is a good communist. This is in the 1930s during the, uh, during the uh, purges. My dad's a great communist. He, I think you should help him out. I know you're a great guy course, never gets a response. Well, days go on, days go on. He's practicing for this parade in the gym by himself. He slams into a statue of Stalin. The Stalin statue breaks, breaks his nose off. And it's just pandemonium in the classroom. There are saboteurs around you. Know, the principal's coming in. There's someone, there's an American capitalist in here making, there's clearly something going on. The teacher's yelling at the kids with the glasses. The kid who's got the, you know, one American as the parent is suspected, you know. And so it just shows, again, the bullying power of being in that kind of state of, being, state of mind and not knowing who to blame, but then paranoia, trying to find someone to blame. So it's a great teaching tool, again, for kids, as is the candy bomber, Gail Helverson. Gail Helverson was the chocolate pilot. He was uh, one of the pilots during the Berlin airlift in 1947. When... For one of the first conflicts was the Berlin Airlift after the Second World War. You know, we were friends with the Soviets. We were just buddies with them. They helped us beat you know, Hitler. Well, then they turned really quickly, and they wanted to get rid of us allies in Berlin. We had East Berlin. We had West Berlin. West Berlin was British, French, American sectors. And Stalin decided to starve off the West Berliners to get us out um, and allow Stalin to take over the whole city and, you know, not have any American presence there at all. So they shut off all the roads. We were supposed to have access to West Berlin through East Germany. It's in the middle of East Germany. So the only way to really combat that was Truman was, allowed, was able to keep the airflow going, cargo aircraft that would round the clock, dropping coal, kerosene, blankets, food, so the Berlin Airlift was a, quite the ordeal. It had never been attempted in history, but that was the only way to keep our presence 
inside a communist country that East Berlin was. And one of the guys that was on one of those flights said, wow, I'm really seeing a lot of these kids. And these kids look like they could be cheered up. So he made little parachutes and he put Hershey's chocolates on it, Wrigley gum, can, other candy at the time. And he dropped these parachutes after dropping his load, then he would drop back. So much that all those kids started, well, ended up on that runway and they're just jumping up in the air to try to you know, get those parachutes that are coming down because candy is pretty hard to come by as is regular food. So it was really a joy for them. Well, he would start getting letters from kids. Dear Colonel, Colonel Halverson, they called him Uncle Wiggly Wings because you know, this plane would do this you know, when it drew, flew by. I am not tall enough to get any candy. Could you please send me some at this address? And then the kids would make a little map and stuff and a little house and stuff. So he got all these letters, and then pretty soon the whole Air Force wing got hold of it, including the commander, who wasn't happy that he had to learn it through the press. But it became Operation, you know, Operation Vittles or whatever that was that they called that, where they were just sending around the clock, they were sending all these care packages. Well, one girl in particular wasn't happy, and that was Mercedes, because Mercedes was upset that her chicken wouldn't, chicken wouldn't lay eggs that they could eat. All those planes were too loud. So she wrote him a letter. Dear Colonel Halverson, I am upset. Please stop flying over my house. My chicken can't lay eggs. We can't eat. P.S. By the way, if you have to go past my house, this is my address, and I really like with some candy. You know, so it's one of those kind of stories. Very, again, heartwarming uh, story of what it's like during the Berlin airlift. And um, they met sometime later in the early 70s when Colonel Halverson went back to become commander of Tempelhof Air Force Base. So again, great resources for kids that maybe even the library has here. And finally, the other one that I really like is Peter Cease's The Wall. He, was, he grew up in Czechoslovakia, communist Czechoslovakia, behind the Iron Curtain. And you can see just how big that Iron Curtain really was in red there. That was several thousand miles. If you, if you talk about you know, Churchill's speech from uh, the Baltic to Trieste, you know, several thousand miles of all those people trapped behind the Iron Curtain after the Second World War. And they were just left. They were just left there. Um, with under Soviet, you know, was under Soviet influence. But Peter Cease um, grew up there. He ended up um, emigrating to the United States in the 1970s or 80s. But this story talks about, and I wish I would have brought that book. When you look at the photos of what it's like to grow up, uh, black and white, red, talking about how the young communists were supposed to tell on their parents, the kids were the informants. They're, they're doing something to sabotage the utopian communist system we have here, right? And then when, he, when he's illustrating the America or the West, it's the Beatles, the Beats poets, the Harlem Globetrotters. It's colorful, awesome, great. You know, so this is, again, it's a great book to learn about the Iron Curtain. And today there's a, an effort to make a bike trail. So if you have a month or two on your hands, a lot of that's been developed over the last few years. You, can, you could bike the Iron Curtain and you'd probably see some remnants as well as you're going along of the Iron Curtain countries. So those remnants are still around. If you actually go to Berlin, you can actually see some. Uh, again, this is in the physical sense of how to educate about the Cold War. You can see some of those slabs of the Berlin Wall in Berlin itself. There's a lot of memorials still there about people who tried to cross the Berlin Wall. Uh, under, this happened to be the site uh, along the river there that they were trying to go underwater. Uh, they're try very creative, very creative in trying to get out and trying to get out even early on when they were produced, when they went up in 1961. Um, but thankfully, that wall's not there anymore. And that's something that was a symbol of the Cold War. Again, there are some reminders to, um, to remember what the Cold War was. Now, a little bit about the book itself. I, I'll just talk about a few aspects of it. There's too much to talk about. Um, talk a little bit about the Stasi prisoners. You, know, you can learn about John von Altman's in the book here from Milton. Um, you can learn about some of the B-52 bomber crashes that occurred here in Wisconsin. There's one that happened during, uh, in, in uh, Williams Bay. There's an Air Force station that had a fighter go down in 1952. So we had a lot of deaths, casualties, just by training accidents here in the state of Wisconsin. But I alluded to this before. Um, you know, the Cold War is thought about, you know, this is World War II on. We never really liked the Soviets. We didn't like them at all. So much so that in 1918, we actually, under Winston Churchill, Winston Churchill was one of the first that was saying, boy, these guys are bad news. We need to do something. They pulled out of World War I. They scared the Allies at that time because it freed up the Kaiser Germans to come fight on the Western Front. Um, 
So World War I, not getting into that whole thing, but it'll, it, it really scared the commanders and thought we were going to lose the First World War due to the Russians pulling out because the communists took over. They're known as the Bolsheviks. That'd be Lenin, Stalin, Trotsky, all those groups that took over. And so we sent troops as part of a larger force into North Russia and Siberia. Some 5,000 troops, American troops, mostly from Michigan and Wisconsin, went to northern, northern North Russia in the port cities there, dropped them off, and then we sent about 8,000 total to Siberia. Now, why were we there? Well, we were there to ostensibly, as Churchill had the plan, to get up, get with the white armies and try to take on the communists early on. But ostensibly, we were going there to, in the north, Russia, to kind of give all that. They had a lot of blankets, coal, um, clothing. The czarist armies had all those storehouses there. So that's where we landed to try to stop the Germans from taking all that stuff and bring, using that against us. Now, when they got there, of course, everything was gone. Uh, the soldiers were stuck there all winter. They were ended up shooting and fighting the early communists. You know, there was always the talk. Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon always said, you know, we never fought face to face. They would tell their Soviet counterparts, not true. You know, this is this is uh, proof of that. And a very forgotten war um, is when, again, when we sent all those troops. John Cudahy, the Cudahy Meat family, that was his son, the founder's son, Patrick Cudahy's son, uh, wrote a book, as many of these soldiers did. But that's a great resource if you want to learn more about the uh, Allied expedition into Russia. And then you can go to the cemetery in Troy, Michigan, where they have an actual polar bear. Now, why did they call themselves the polar bear? Because they agreed on that when they, when they finally left in 1919 from North Russia, after a lot of letters, like, why is my son or husband in Russia? They didn't understand people were back home. Um, but they finally were able to get them out of the ice, get them back home. And a lot of them, um, remains were brought back, and a lot of them were buried in Troy, Michigan, where a number of them from this. So they call themselves the Michigan Polar Bears for serving in the North, North um, Atlantic there, or Baltic area. One thing that's very puzzling to uh, a number of people is how uh, someone like Stalin's daughter would end up in Wisconsin. And Stalin had uh, a couple of sons and a, one daughter. Um, one was uh, caught, it was a POW in a German prison camp, was shot ostensibly for escaping, if you want to believe that tale, whatever happened with that. Um, so he, one Stalin, uh, Stalin uh, son died. The other one, after his death, just kind of became a playboy, more of an alcoholic type. Svetlana was always a free spirit, though, and always cherished her. And Svetlana was about the only person that could boss her dad around. She would write letters to her dad. Dear dad, I would like a piece of cake. Please give me a piece of cake. Signed, your little princess, and then fold it up, and the servant would go take it. And, oh, here, dear Svetlana, here is your cake. I love you so much. It was like the very kind, gentle father-daughter relationship. Well, that ended up not being the case, as we all know. Uh, as she grew up in like her teenage years, she fell in love with a guy that her dad didn't approve of. And a couple days later, where do you think he ends up? First train out to Siberia. Don't come back. The guy gets out of prison you know, a couple years later, decides to come back. Three days later, we found you. Go back. You know, so she was she finally saw that side of her dad that would just ruin people's lives for no reason. Ruin love, ruin childhoods, all that stuff. Uh, so she had a very bittersweet, mixed relationship. Obviously, she enjoyed the privileges of being in a their relative version of elite society, uh, but understood the kind of monster he was. And after he died in 1953, as uh, a lot of the, um, any kings or dictators or that, you know, the siblings, the siblings, the husbands, sometimes they, they just distance themselves because they don't want to be an enemy or the next person on the chopping block. She changed her name to her mother's maiden name, which was Ayueva. The first time she actually got out of the country, though, is where it gets interesting. She became a teacher. She was teaching in a university. She married an Indian doctor that was studying uh, in Russia, in, in Moscow, uh, as part of the Communist Party. He died. She decided to bring his remains back to India. While she was in India, her first trip abroad in 1967, she decides she's going to make a break for it. She goes into the American embassy or attache in New Delhi and says, I am Svetlana Stalin, and I wish to 
uh, immigrates to the United States. And you imagine it's probably six, seven o'clock in the evening, there's one person at the desk like, what are you talking about? You know, do you have your papers? And her, her passport says, in essence, her mother's maiden name. Like, what do you, wait a sec, you know, let me check this out. And they spend like minutes, hour, and he comes back and holy cow, Stalin's daughter wants to come immigrate to the United States. That's a big coup during the Cold War. And so she is spirited out and brought to New Jersey. Why New Jersey, Princeton University? Because there's another guy named George Kennan that has become the first Soviet expert um, in the 1920s. He's from Milwaukee. He was, he was from Milwaukee, graduated from Southwest or Northwest um, St. John's Military Academy in Delafield. He went to Princeton and then became a very big diplomat. He was one of the first diplomats to the Soviet Union after the Second World War. And so they're teamed up. And she's big fanfare, the cameras are there, the TV's there. She's writing books for a couple of years, makes a lot of money. Well, then the star fades. Life is kind of dull. She gets letters from a lot of people around the world, around the country. One of which is Ogilvana Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright's ex, uh, widow. Ogilvana runs the architectural, uh, what would you call it out in Arizona? Talis, Talis, now Talison is here. So their version out there, right? Talison West. Dear Svetlana, you would be a great addition to come out here to Arizona. It's really nice this time of year. You should come out and visit. It's warm, it's comforting, you'd really like it. So she accepts the offer to go out there. Unbeknownst to her, this is where it gets really weird. Ogilvana Wright had her own daughter named Svetlana. And Svetlana, her Svetlana, died in a car crash a few years prior. Ogilvana is not only sinister enough to convince her to marry Wes uh, Wesley Peters, who her daughter was married to, but also needs some money to stay afloat. All the properties in Arizona and Spring Green, all the people to employ, um, is getting a little heavy. You know, so she needs money. She's in for the money, and again, dastardly hook, hooking her up with her, her former son-in-law. And they get engaged in a couple of weeks after that. Well, as they did travel often between Spring Green and Arizona, that's where the connection is. She spends a lot of her money on Wes's uh, son, who has a farm in the area, dumps a lot of money there, dumps a lot of money to Ogavana. Pretty soon, she's broke, she's, she's miserable, she has a child, and then a few years, like in the, in the late 70s, she's like, I'm, I'm just done. She divorces him, flees the country. She's bouncing around the country, she ends up in Great Britain, and eventually in the 80s, she ends up back in the Soviet Union. Naturally, she goes to the Soviet Union, and they get the cameras, I renounced the United States. I think it was a mistake, blah, blah, blah. She lives there for a while, kind of fades away. Well, in the early 2000s, she decides to come back. And she parks herself in Richland Center. And she lives pretty much in obscurity for many years. The people were questioning what happened to Svetlana Stalin. And so back in that era, here's a personal, the personal connection here. You go on Yahoo chat rooms, and people have these topics. What happened to Svetlana? Oh, she got, went to Switzerland, and she just took all of her father's gold. And her, her father had all this gold. Okay. No, she's off in a monastery in Europe somewhere. She just went into a covenant, and she's just hiding now. She doesn't want to be seen by anybody. And so all these other theories are coming around. And then this other random poster says, well, she did have that thing with the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright people in Wisconsin. Oh. So my bells are going off. I'm like, holy cow, I'm going to find Svetlana Stalin, and I'm going to, oh, man, I'm, gonna, I'm on to something here. You know? So I had this great idea to go to my employer at the library, Rocha Library, and they have phone books from all over Wisconsin. Richland Center. Stalin, no, wait, wait a second. Stalin, is that going to be going by Stalin? Uh, it's Peters, right? There's a listing for Alana Peters. <laughs> so... I get the courage to actually call Svetlana Stalin a day or two later. No answer. Like, okay, whatever. Like a week later. Like, okay, I'm going to try this again. Hello? I'm like shocked in that first use. I don't know what to say. Like, hello, I'm looking for Svetlana Elueva, Svetlana Stalin. I'm sorry if, I'm, if you're the wrong number, but I understand that uh, you might be her, and I'm looking to get in contact. I'm with the Cold War Museum, you know, pulling out every 
nervous word I can do, you know. I the silence. And then I hear, you must have been mistaken. Uh, this is not, uh, this is not Svetlana Stalin. Sorry for your time. Okay, Russian accent. I can, I can hear it. All right. So I don't even bother. Kind of some time fades away, maybe six months, a year. I read the Wisconsin State Journal. Front page. Svetlana Stalin, Richland Center, has got this new a musical or a play about her life. It's called Svetlana and Svetlana, and she's given all these interviews after being in hiding for all these years. <laughs> you got to be kidding me, you know. So I'm, uh, I did later find out that she was in contact with a few, very few select reporters over the years. I mean, so she would have some connection to the outside world, some like literary or magazine reporters. So there were, there's been some volumes even recently written on her, but here I thought I'd just crack the case. You know, <laughs> I found Svetlana... Uh, she, would, she would claim that, you know, father never had any gold and it was just a joke. And she's just, she was looked at as some, you know, retiree in, nor, in, in, nor, in central Wisconsin. You know, had the track suit on all the time, going to the rummage sales. And nobody ever knew, though. That's the weird thing. Nobody ever knew Svetlana Stalin was among them. But just kind of like a, one of those odd, trivial um, incidents. The space race is another segment of the Cold War that uh, get to the moon or developing a satellite like this Sputnik, right? And so how does Sputnik uh, you know, relate to this, uh, this grand badger state of ours? Well, as you can see, there was actually a crash of one of, the, one of the Sputniks in 1962. It happened, um, yeah, Labor Day weekend. And the way the Sputnik system worked, of course, the first one in 1957, there was a race to get a satellite up in the uh, orbit. It was done under the guise of a challenge amongst a national geographic type thing, geological. Geophysical. Geophysical. It was on there. You can read that here. I, I can cut and paste that pretty good. I can't say it. Um, so it was done under this guise of advancing science, right? So the Soviets and Americans figure out right away, we got to get control of the skies. And so in October of 1957, of course, we're just fumbling away at our program, and all of a sudden, Soviets get that big old ball, um, 100, 100 plus, 150 pounds or whatever, a big giant iron thing going up. And the high tech at that point was beep, beep, beep. And you can hear it on, the, on your shortwave, beep. And we're frightened. I mean, holy cow. America, we're on the cutting edge, right? We've, we've figured out polio, transistor, you know, you know, the, all sorts of medical advances and these godless communists, they beat us into space. We're scared, we're embarrassed. Well, we better hurry up and get, a, get, a, get our own satellite up there. And so we get that, that Navy program, that Vanguard, and we get that thing on the launch pad. And we're gonna show those Soviets, we can get up there too, a month or two later, and <laughs> explodes embarrassing. Uh, the press gets along and says, yeah, Kaputnik, Flopnik, you know, we're embarrassed. And so now we got to really call in the big guns, right? We got to call that guy. We got to call that Nazi, right? That Werner von Braun guy, because he knows what he's doing. We got him out in New Mexico. Now we're going to task him with getting that rocket up. And he does. He gets that rocket to carry that thing um, in 1958. And so it's a back and forth, but the Soviets are well on track with their rocket systems. They launch a, their second one in 1958, and that would be with that dog. You know, the space program that we had, we chose monkeys. But a lot, a lot of animals, creatures, frogs, mice, you name it, depending on outer space. We tried a lot of rabbits. Uh, they went with dogs, stray dogs. And so that was the whole, let's get a, the point is to get a human in space, clearly that um, Gary Gagarin finally did on the, on the third launch. But the dog was the second one, right? And that puppy went up into space and became a hero. And when that puppy came back, that's what the Soviet people would tell me, that puppy came back and, whoa, oh my goodness, and oh man, we're proud of our country. And look at that animal, and that animal that creature, that um, Leica is on a farm and he's getting all, she's getting all the fresh air and running around in the, in the grass and the tall grass and, and just treated very well. And she's doing great and boy, living her life out like you wouldn't believe it. Well, years later, they gave the real story of Leica. 
they could die in a few minutes, <laughs> suffocated, you know. And these Soviet citizens that I met over there, they're like, hey, we were told that dog was fine. And, you know, they kind of laugh about it now, but they're like, boy, that's sad, you know. Uh, Yuri Gagarin, we know the story, the first uh, uh, human in orbit. Um, we put Alan Shepard up after that. The fourth one was a different type of system uh, to communicate, uh, see what we could communicate, uh, a different communication system at the time from the Soviets. And they lost control of that thing really quick, whether it was a month or whatever the case was. And they had to guess where these things were gonna land. They had these amateur astronomers that popped up that were gonna figure out where they're gonna come down somewhere. So they figured out, it's, you know, we didn't have computers back then, we just had, uh, you know, they do orbits and calculations and all that. They figured there's gonna be a three day window in the first weekend of September, probably over Michigan, but maybe Wisconsin. And there happened to be one of the amateur astronomer clubs in Milwaukee that was sitting probably on the highest point. And he's watching up there in the middle of the night on that day. And here comes that, he sees that, right? And so he jumps, he tells his buddies, and they jump in the car and they go north. And by the time, before they even get there, these guys stumble across something in the middle of the road. They don't know what it is. And so these police officers are just doing their rounds early morning. And they come across this thing, and they're like, oh, what's that thing? You know, it's something. They go by, and they don't think anything of it. Well, then they go another round, like an hour later. They go back and do the rounds again. Oh, we better get that out of the road. We gotta just, oh, oh it's hot. No, no, well, it's heavy. It's a 20 pound piece of metal. Well, we gotta get that thing out of there. Oh, and we gotta call in that truck. Maybe the foundry dropped it, you know, so we've gotta make a call. And they get back, to the, get back to the precinct again, and all of a sudden, the word is out. Sputnik landed, <clears throat> and these guys are like Keystone cops, you know. They're like, holy cow, that's they're gonna do it. And so this, uh, the amateur astronomers are showing up, and the police are there. The military is showing up because they get word of it, and they accompany that original specimen. It's 20 pounds. They take it out to MIT. They pick up the Cambridge, and then, you can imagine they're like chipping away. They're gonna figure out what is this thing that the Soviets are up to, and. They tell the Soviets right away, hey, we got we, we have your satellite. No, you don't. <laughs> it's official. You know. We don't know anything about satellite. And they didn't want that thing until finally in January. So this is a few months after. And that whole time, we're sending it to different labs out west. I mean, test this thing. And pretty soon, by the time we actually gave it back, it's 14 pounds. <laughs> so the original one. <laughs> Back, you know, they finally admitted, oh, that satellite. Oh, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, we'll take it. And they took it back. So they have the original one. But if you go to the Rar West Museum in Manitowoc, it's a Victorian house. It's on Main Street. You can actually see a ring that was dedicated there where Sputnik landed in 1962. And you can see a replica of Sputnik before there's, there's other ones floating around. I think over at Harvard, too. Um, but there's a replica of that. And of course, you see the nice little police officers that, didn't know what to do with that then. Um, but nonetheless, that's the story of how the arms race kind of involves uh, Wisconsin as well. Outside of Kiwani, Wisconsin, there was a ship made, a ship created during the Second World War. It's called the USS Pueblo. This goes into some of my questionable vacation choices. I probably need an intervention at some point, but I actually visited North Korea. Partly to go on that ship. That was built in Kiwani in 1944. And that little ship, Went down the Mississippi, the supply ship, cargo ship, and then eventually retrofitted to be listening in in the seas of Japan. So it made its way to San Diego in 1966, it would have been, 67 maybe. But in January of 67, it makes its way to the GFC, 1968, rather, the Sea of Japan, and there, this is the most highly sophisticated eavesdropping equipment you can imagine at the time. This is the eavesdropping equipment. And we're listening in on the Chinese and North Koreans. Well, they're, they're a month, I can tell you a month. And the North Koreans decided they're just going to take the ship. They're in international waters. Waters has just been proven beyond a doubt. In retrospect, North Koreans decided they're just going to snag the ship. There's 83 personnel on board. There's one cartographer, civilian, to give them that kind of that kind of cover. They had one turret that they didn't have loaded. Uh, you're not supposed to because that would make you an aggressive ship, right? Um, but they came on there and they started firefighting. 
firefights erupt, uh, bring your ship in. The crew on board is trying to destroy everything they can, shred the papers. They're getting boarded by the North Koreans eventually, and they're having them follow them into North Korea. They are blindfolded, 82 survive. Uh, one, one man uh, got killed, one uh, naval personnel got uh, killed in the firefights. So There's 82 men. They're blindfolded and they get off the port and they're getting rocks are getting thrown at them. They're getting kicked, you know, hurled, you know, curse words and all that. Traitors, espionage, Americans, you know, that kind of thing going on. And they get interrogated like you wouldn't believe. When I am talking with, uh, it's not a picture up here, no. When we go to the Fatherland Victorious Museum, Victorious Fatherland Museum in Pyongyang, the tour guide, boy, we treated these, these, these personnel. Well, your country didn't want them. Your country kept them here for 11 months. They did not want to negotiate with us. We fed them, we clothed them, and they've got pictures and the woolly hats and the nice jackets and all that. The truth is they got beat up, they got punched in the face, they got kicked, they ate slop with flies buzzing around. They lost quite a bit of weight. They were harassed to sign, you know, papers. You can, you were intruding, intruding, intruding on North Korean space. You are a war criminal. Uh, it was just horrible, just horrible. The worst part came when Time Magazine decided to publish a photo of them on the front cover in their socialism classes. You know, they taught them these wonderful virtues of socialism. And the guys would be like this, right? Like this. You can see that photo, you look it up. And the North Koreans didn't know what that was. So for the longest time, they got away with it because they would wave that, how are you doing? Good to see you. You know, walking down to their rooms or out to the exercise yard. What is that? Oh, that's a Hawaiian good luck sign. Oh, yeah, they didn't know. Until our press decides to publish the photo. Then they realize what it was because Time Magazine said, boy, they're just, they're giving it back the best they can. This is uh, non-compliance the best they can do. And then, then the beatings happen. That was what they considered their hell week. Uh, Rich Regala, who was a uh, prisoner on the boat, I had him up in Kiwana giving a talk a few years. Got to know him pretty well over the years. He individually doesn't have any real teeth because they would say, sit down, stand up, rifle butt. Sit down, stand up, punch in the face. Awful, it happened to all of them. And to this day, he had to get all his teeth restored. They never got really any recognition until relatively recently uh, about the ordeal that those 82 men got, um, you know, went through in North Korea. And again, it's a reminder of this ship today is the Cold War. In North Korea, they still think it is the Cold War. I actually had a good time. I ran the Pyongyang Marathon. I finished second place in the 10K. I got to meet the tour guides from Great Miss Yu. Why Yu was funny. Um, very, very amicable. Mr. Che took a special interest in me in the end. He was the son of a diplomat that served during the time of Romania when Ceausescu was, was thrown out of power. And then uh, Miss Rim, L-I-M, was the one in the middle in the pink. She was the first guy I met at the airport. She had a, a bag, a purse, that a Playboy bunny on it. I said, do you know what that means? She said, no. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if she would have understood, you know. But clearly they give certain people, certain things uh, to make it look like they have some sort of status, right? But they're all very nice. Mr. Che took an interest in me. I got a little mad at the Victoria's Museum, got the tap on the shoulder after they're talking about how the, you know, Amer Americans used biological weapons during World War, during the Korean War. And he was like, are you okay? And he got the phone call. He got the phone call and everything. I'm telling you, he got the phone call. Uh, he said, oh, that was my wife. She wants milk. She wants me to pick up milk for dinner. Are you okay? I must have just been just like a face or something. Like that. Anyway, so I had a good time generally with her for four days and didn't really have any trouble. But again, it's a Cold War legacy country that I visited as I did the, uh, the next year is in Chernobyl. I went there for the 30th anniversary, breathed in that fresh radioactive air you know, for three days. Uh, honestly, it was fine. The radio app, uh, the Geiger counter I had there in front of reactor number four, uh, you couldn't even uh, really. You couldn't really read anything on there. There really wasn't much in the air. Uh, it's, a lot of it's in the ground, in the bushes, and the trees. Um, so you could, you could get at that time up to back and forth. That's now closed off. If you look at a picture, you don't what you don't see to the right of that photo is that giant um, 
cylinder looking thing that, that we put over it. The sarcophagus of the roof had a 30 year time span, uh, 30 year lifespan, so they had to replace it. There's you know, leaking, you know, you know what out of there. There's birds flying in and out, there's critters. Um, so not good. So we finally sealed that up, and that'll be sealed up now for I think 100 years now. But you won't ever see that roof anymore. Uh, we did meet a uh, one woman named Maria. She's in the Babushkas of Chernobyl documentary. Recognize her. She's one of the probably six that they talked to. It's about 150 Babushkas that still live there. There were men at one time, but a lot all died off. Um, but there's villages that are scattered all around the city of Pripyat. Chernobyl is actually a town 10 miles south of the reactor site. That um, uh, it's more like a vacation spot. It looks like it looks like here. It looks really beautiful. The river looks nice. Um, she greeted us with green beans. Uh, it was, was Russian. We have the translation, but she's very hospitable. They drink the water, they swim, they fish. You know things that you wouldn't think happen in Chernobyl, because what we hear is the clearly the doom. As we watched, there's a lot of interest in the Chernobyl uh, recently. So I advise anybody who hasn't seen any of those. But we got the tour of the city in Pripyat. We got to go in the schools, the nurseries. Uh, this is very high tech in 1986. The Atticus, they didn't have a lot of technology. We did gas masks. People ask me, people wear masks in the control. Was, no, nobody wears a mask. Even men who were working on the reactor right here, they were working on that reactor to ready that cylinder to go over. They're up there <laughs> they were grinding things down, getting that thing ready. Uh, they weren't wearing any masks or anything. But I did see these on the ground gas masks. I said, what are these all about? Well, this was, they, th they thought the Americans were going to invade Ukraine. The Soviets had that in their mind. Americans were going to be the aggressors. Of course, we had the opposite. Soviets were going to be the aggressors, right? And so we had to practice. We had to practice putting our gas masks on, and we had to put masks on when we did grenade training in school. All the kids did grenade training. And this was true of most of the Soviet Union and Soviet republics. So these are just kind of just really eerie. You know, what are these doing in these schoolrooms and these classrooms we're into? Uh, but we got to go into one of the apartment buildings. That's a grocery store on the right. It's all dilapidated and cryptid. We still do the tours there, Monday through day through day. I took a three-day tour, and you get to really see what it's like uh, in 1986. Nothing's changed. Mm -hmm. And finally, the other Soviet um, country, <coughs> legacy country that, that I visited that's in the bluff, again, talks about the Cold War today, what happened in the Cold War, um, these kind of visits. Um, I went there into the Afghan marathon in 2017. It's been a few years now. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. I got to meet one of the Mujahideen warriors named Alo, kind of like Allah, but with an O. Uh, he's to the left of me in that photo. I'm telling you, like the Soviet invasion time, 1979, 1980, his father was a commander of a small regiment of these Mujahideen warriors that were trying to stop um, the Soviets and the Tajikistan, which is the north border, right? Um, but they were going through with tanks. I mean, they were going through with columns, obviously, uh, his personnel and whatnot. Uh, they're throwing rocks, they're throwing sticks. I mean, he's the, but he's the Rambo of his time. He had to take over when his dad went down. His dad died almost right away. He became, at a very young age, the commander of this group of 60 men. And um, they, they laid the traps, right? I'm telling you, the Rambo jumping out of the grass with the, with the machine gun, jumping out of the trees and, you know, hitting somebody out of the water, that kind of thing. Uh, but the ordeals that they had to go through uh, and then they, to, to get them out. One of which, ironically, was, well, not ironically, but was Chernobyl. Because Chernobyl, if you remember, they had all those helicopters that were trying to put out that fire, right? They had to recall them from Afghanistan to do that. So they were losing the war badly for a lot of reasons, but now they had to pull out those helicopters. I asked Alo through the translator, I said, what did America do for you? And he said, two things. Money and those Stinger missiles, right? Those missiles, because the helicopters would be sitting ducks going through those mountain passes. He said, the Americans were our friends. Thank you. America did their job. They took out the Soviets. And to this day, they're still, they are still, they were still thankful to the people that did meet that were alive during that era. He now sells rugs on Chicken Street in, um, in Kabul. I said rugs, not rugs. Sometimes people ask me what I said. Um, but they have the International Land, the Landmine, Landmine Museum there. I've never seen so many landmines in my life. They've got AK-47s, different coughs. Uh, Soviet tanks you see on the side of the road. You get a helicopter, Soviet helicopter sitting there. Again, a lot of the, again, uh, kind of like the residue of what the Soviets, the Soviet presence is still there. You still see buildings there. 
and other remnants of that war. Got to meet the kids a lot. Uh, we were with a group called Free to Run. That's why I went. Um, I was one of 15 international athletes that went. And that is an organization that supports women and girls in sports. So the Afghan Marathon was um, underwritten by us 15 Americans and paid the entry fee to allow them to run and give, give them some proper clothing. And then but hundreds of kids, boys, girls, were running that race. Um, to talk about the equipment, there were men running the Afghan marathon in jeans, uh, dress shoes like this, uh, shirts, just like a dress shirt, because they just don't have things like that. So they were very thankful that we were there and supporting. And a lot of those girls and women that we met, um, if you can imagine, are in danger right now. And that is something I've been in contact with the Untamed Borders, the group that brought me in, keeping at least people that had been there abreast of what happened to those tour guides that were so helpful with us and some of the women and girls. And a number of them are just like in these uh, third countries trying to get to the United States or Britain or something. So it's a, it's a very uh, contemporary issue. It just happens to be that I was part of that group and um, I'm just, I just pray that a lot of those women and girls get out and aren't um, subjected to whatever that the Taliban has in store with them. So that's a lot of information. Um, I do, again, appreciate that everybody sits through and I don't get to a lot of my books, because uh, I think it's a great book to read, Cold War, Wisconsin, and Cold War, Illinois. But thank you for sitting through it. And if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Oh, real, real um, I'm wondering if any of your research uh, addressed um, fallout from our own nuclear tests that may have bloomed into Wisconsin back in the 50s. Sorry about that. Um, so the question was, did we have any, did we have any nuclear radiation and things like that? Um, there was radiolo radiological testing in Rhinelander in the, not the Nicolay Forest, but whatever's over there. That I just was called about, as a matter of fact, for a Monkey Journal Sentinel article, um, where they put, they purposely placed a very small device that emitted and to see what the effects would be. So this was, as best you can say, in a controlled test, probably in the 50s. And so those things did, those did exist. And, and honestly, it's, if you think about it, you needed to know what was the effect going to be should something happen. So they, like the government did undertake testing like that. As far as what the lasting effects of that is, probably minimal. I mean, it was so little, so rural, so, so long ago. That's one instance that I, that I do know of. We did have a, a missile that um, tipped over on the Waukesha site, but never nothing happened to it. But those are the kind of stories that you know, those those did happen in the United States with the Nikes. Um, you know, somebody dropped a wrench in a, in a I don't know, I think it was in Arkansas in a tank missile. Um, all of a sudden, it's leaking. You know, New Jersey had a fire. So they, they, those stuff, that stuff did happen. There's still a nuclear bomb that was in the Savannah Delta. That's, I think they found it, but it was just one of those Air Force missions and oops, and that was in the 60s. So that stuff did happen. I don't know to the extent that it caused any damage because the, those warheads are pretty well encased. They did build them to sustain, um, but there were some accidents, but nothing, nothing here that would warrant you know, the amount of how how far did that Red Dawn or Red War in northern Wisconsin go when they had released some information about Russia attacking? They did a test. Did you know anything about that? Uh, not movie Red Dawn. Um, Right, but they simulated something in northern Wisconsin, I heard, about Russia's invading or whatever. There was a big panic. Is there any truth to that? Or I know I'd have to, I, that's the first time I'm hearing of that. I'm sure there were tests that were done or uh, simulations, because there were strategic Air Force command bases. There were drills. Um, there, there were kids in Kiwami that were, because they were a nuclear base, or a nuclear base, a nuclear plant that they would have, they would get on a bus to see how fast they could, they could get out. So though, I know those things happen, but as far as like a, a military type test, I know about the missions to try to see if the bombers could evade our radar capacities. 
Um, yeah, so there were civilian, there were military, but I don't know if I can comment on it. And I have to look into that. Just remind me later. Well, if there are no other questions, we'll let Chris go over to the table. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate your.